to serve, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we can just look out, Lord, and see through nature, Lord, how we can see your fingerprints and your footprints, Lord, on everything, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you created this place, and the Bible says that uh, your speech goes out, Lord, throughout this whole earth, Lord. You know, this whole creation is just praising you and preaching the gospel, Lord. I thank you once again for Brother Deems uh, coming here, Lord, taking out of his time, Lord, to come and minister to us, Lord. And we're, uh, I know several are excited, Lord, about hearing this tonight, Lord, and these next few nights, Lord, and just hearing about science, Lord, and the truth of science, Lord, and true science is found in the Bible, Lord. And I just pray you'd open up our hearts and our minds, Lord, to the truth that we'll find tonight. Uh, give Brother Deems clarity in his mind, Lord, and his thoughts as he goes through this information, Lord. And I pray that we would take this information, Lord, from this place tonight and bring it out, Lord, and use it, Lord, in our daily lives, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless all it's said and done, Lord. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, before we get started, there is one handout I'm going to give right now, and I'm going to give you another one in the second session. But this one is the introduction. All right, I want to give out, um, John, can you hand these out for me? One per family, all right? Just one per family tonight. Uh, and then if you would like some more, I, if I'm going to have to make more, I'll make more in a minute here. Uh, but I want to give one per family. If you would like more later on, that's fine. You know, again, we'll have it available through these next several days. So don't worry about uh, getting, if you want another copy or you want to give one to somebody else or whatever. Uh, but I'll go run off some more. I wasn't sure how many to make. Um, but uh, if you got one already, don't take another one, all right? So we'll let John take them out. Again, it's good to have Brother Deans with us. This will be the third year, amen, that we've had him in here. Uh, we had him in here two years ago for the, our King James Bible Conference, again, going over to King James and the Bibles and the different versions and all. Uh, so Brother Deans came for that. And then last year he came for a Rightly Dividing uh, seminar. And, man, we had a great time then. And uh, he called me up a few months ago, and we decided that we were going to go forward with this uh, science in the Bible. He had a couple other things. I'll make some more, John, in a second. Don't worry. I'm going to go make some more. How many more do we need? How many more do we need? I'll make some more copies. We'll make about four or five more copies. I'll, I'll make them in a minute. But anyway, Brother Deems has been a great blessing. You know, he's a good friend of mine now. Uh, fun guy to be around. Amen. We got a dry sense of humor. We got that military sense of humor. In here. I don't know what it is. Amen. But he likes it. He is a northerner. Amen. He's not a southerner. He lives down south now. But amen. We're converting him back to the north. Amen. Back to the right side of things. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's Brother Dean. You come on up here. Good to have you with us, brother. And uh, you give us. Yeah, for those that uh, don't know, I, I was born about 100 miles from New York High Falls, New York, Kingston, New York. Uh, not very far. Last time I got to go up there and visit my home, uh, where I grew up in for about 15 years of my life. Of course, being in the military, you travel a lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, my hometown is just up the road a little bit. So I like the rocks. I like rocks, you know. In Florida, there are no rocks. There's nothing like it, you know, so, uh, and trees and mountains and hills and uh, dirt, real dirt, I like that, you know, you have real dirt up here, down there, it's kind of sandy, it's not very good. Uh, okay, so this is the Bible Conference, Science in the Bible, I'm Dr. Carl W. Deans, Burning Break Ministries, Pensacola, Florida, so, uh, uh, pleasure to be here, uh, to do Science in the Bible, now, in some sense, you all are guinea pigs for this uh, seminar because this is the first time I've ever done a seminar like this. I've done portions of this, and never put it together in, in one big package. So as you go through your handouts, you might see a few typos, uh, just uh, in, a, in a gentle, kind way. Say, "Hey, brother Deems, like it, this does this is spelled wrong or whatever." But uh, I did the best I could with what I had. Uh, this science in the Bible comes uh, about from, uh, I did a master's thesis on theistic science in the Bible. And what I was interested in is, uh, of course, I, I have, you'll see I have some background with uh, science and engineering, that type of thing. I, I flew uh, fighters, I was a weapon systems officer and flew fighters for the Air Force. Oh, by the way, Ed, Ed came up with something today. He was talking about deer. What is that about a deer? When you see a deer, you see... Steaks and chops and, and uh, chop. oh, okay. that's right, brother. Anything that uh, tastes that good deserves to die, brother. Oh. Oh. <laughs> anyway, that's it. But now, 
I understand that a little bit from coming from the Air Force because I flew fighters. There's only two types of airplanes in the world. There's fighters and then there's targets. So uh, now when I fly in these airlines, I feel like uh, I'm a target. You know? So uh, I'm flying in a target. But that's what we used to say. There's only two types of airplanes in the world. How's that for, how's that for a saying? Brother Ed? Amen. There's only fighters and targets. There you go. So there you go. <laughs> All right, science about. So I did my master's thesis, and where, what I saw was very interesting about uh, science in the present day is there's like a pushback, there's a, a fight back in the last 10, 15, 20 years against naturalistic science. Uh, there's a lot of Christians out there that are scientists. There's a lot of people that sign uh, proclamations. For example, they don't believe in Darwinism, or you haven't convinced me yet. Uh, you've had 150 years, and they, they still haven't convinced you know some biologists, chemists, engineers, all that type of thing. So uh, so I got interested. I said, that, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to study that about science and uh, kind of see where it heads, where it leads. And so uh, this is this uh, next few uh, lessons here, you're going to see uh, what I found during my master's thesis. Basically, most of the modern science that you have today is a result of Christianity. I know that's a shock to you. But uh, uh, in the last uh, 50, in the last uh, maybe 50, 75 years, they pretty much kicked God out of the government, kicked him out of science, kicked him out of the classroom. Uh, but God was, because of the Reformation, because of Christianity, is the reason why you have things that you have today. You wouldn't have the United States of America if it wasn't for the Reformation and the Christianity and for the, the Bible, King, you know, your King James Version Bible. You would not have any of that today. So uh, this is... Science and the Bible, we're going to talk about both. Uh, believe it or not, they go together. True science and the Bible go together. Right. You can have both. If you have true science, I mean, if it's truth, right? right? If science, the definition of science is knowledge. Uh, we'll show the verse, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmness show it his handiwork. <coughs> right? So if, if it's true, it'll be, it'll match. You know, we shouldn't have any, we don't have any, uh, have to worry about it, okay? Uh, so, this will be the introduction. What we'll do is we'll go for a little bit, and then we'll take a break. I see some treats out there, but please come back for the second session. All right? So, I'm, I'm being nice to you. Give you a break. Don't disappear. Well, if you have to leave, I guess. You know, it's okay. I'm not holding you hostage. But the idea is we're going to have a, we're going to have a, listen, we're having a, we're going to do a session. This is the introduction. Small break, and then some more. Okay? Don't think it's over when I'm done with the introduction. Okay? And I might just stop the introduction halfway through, depending on the time. So I understand, I've been in your place. I sit, you know, Sunday after Sunday, I sit and listen to preachers and stuff, and I understand there's a, there's a, a time of useful consciousness. Yeah. All right, so that's what we're, we're gonna, we're gonna try to keep it going. All right, introduction, what is this? Uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about, science in the Bible. And so this is just going to be the initial introduction. I want to talk a little bit about my family. Uh, this is uh, Sarah and Greg here. These are, uh, I don't know where the other picture went. Oh yeah, there's my wife and I, okay? And we produced a family. Uh, Sarah, Lydia, Joshua, and Elizabeth. Elizabeth's the only one that's not married now. Let me get back. There is Greg. He stole the oldest daughter. And he's to the right. But they produced our first grandbaby. So you'll see her throughout the presentation. It's great to have grandbaby. So he's not such a bad guy after all. No. All right, so uh, let's see the next one. And there she is. Her name is Anna. Okay. Anna Sharp. This is Michael and Lydia. And uh, Greg and Sarah, they're, they're heavy uh, involved in their school. Mike's, uh, I mean, uh, Greg is a, a school teacher. Michael is uh, paralegal. And they're active in their, their church as well. In fact, they spent a lot, of, that's how they got to know each other, was a lot of time in the church activities. Uh, this is Josh, he just got married in July to Caitlin, and they're in Atlanta studying uh, post, uh, postgraduate work. Josh is studying prosthetics, and Caitlin's studying to be a therapist. This is what I used to do before I grew up. I flew F4s in the back seat of F4 Phantoms. And then I also flew F-111s uh, in Cannon Air Force Base. And 
And then I got involved in space operations with the Global Positioning System. And this is my last flight in the uh, Air Force. I got to fly in an F-16. So I have some technical background. I have, I have uh, let's see, um, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, bachelor, a Master's Degree in Management, a Master's Degree in Space Operations. I have, uh, of course, the uh, Bachelor of Divinity, ba uh, Master's of Theology, and then a Doctor of Theology. So I have more education than I ought to have. You know, <laughs> it's good for any being. Plus, they go through all this other stuff where you learn space and flying and everything. So I know a little bit about science. I know a little bit about uh, engineering, that type of thing. So I just want to let, let you know that background. I mean, my guys would send, I was a detachment commander and op operations center commander. My guys would send uh, commands up to the satellites and uh, change uh, uh, configurations on sensors. They also mounted the state of health of sensors. I was involved in simulators for the Air Force, you know, B2, B1, that type of thing. So if you want to, you know, but I don't want you guys, some of most of you guys heard that before, so we want to press on, okay? But I just want to let you know I have a technical background. Uh, this is what I do now. I go to, uh, go to Africa, Guatemala. I go to places like, uh, churches like this, and, and, and preach the gospel and give presentations. Here I am in Africa. I'm going to get to go there uh, in November. Uh, this is an orphanage in the school in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, Africa. This is when I went to Guatemala. This lady right here is my wife, Marilyn. I probably didn't introduce her. I just said, this is my wife. But this is my wife, this is my wife Marilyn. And they're singing to a whole, whole bunch of kids. They're in a public school in Guatemala. Everywhere you go, except America, you can preach and teach and sing and give the gospel. Except in America, in public school. You know, yeah. public school. In fact, this was a Roman Catholic public school, if you want to call it. It was, head, it was headed by a Roman Catholic. The principal was Roman Catholic. And uh, he saw what we were doing. He says, hey, can you come to our school and do that? <laughs> and so that's what we did. The girls come out and sing. So. All right. So praise the Lord. Oh, this is me preaching in Guatemala, doing an object lesson. All right. This is my wife doing her first special. Never sang in front of a church before. She's, she, she was singing outside in open air, but she never sung inside a church before. And she was singing with these girls, and they were all singing Spanish songs. And her first song that she ever, time she ever preached, first preached, every time she did a special in church was in a Spanish church singing Spanish songs. So how do you like that? So just... Just ask, just do what the Lord tells you to do, and next thing you don't know what you're going to be doing. Okay. Here she is. She's giving her testimony. She's never been out on the street before, giving her test, testimony to my knowledge, and here she is giving her testimony. And, of course, Dr. Haig is translating for her. Okay, science in the Bible. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. These are going to be our theme verses. Okay? So this is the first one. Here's the second one. Psalms 19, 1 to 3. It's kind of off the chart here, but the heavens declare the glory of God and the children of his handiwork. Day and the day utter speech, and night and the night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And then this is a warning, 1 Timothy 6.20. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science false is so called. Just like there's a, a false gospel, well guess what? There's a false science. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. right. So, like I said, if it's true science, it's going to match with the Bible. But if it's not, if it's not, then it won't match. So, science falsely so called. We don't have to worry about science. Science is, is good. So we're going to talk about what is science. Uh, in this, uh, mostly tonight we're going to talk about what is science, and we're going to talk about systems of unbelief and belief, and why certain certain pop portions of the world never really advance much in science. It's because of their religion. That's why. Okay? What they believe about the natural world is so fouled up, they didn't, they didn't advance very far in science. Why did we advance in, in science? Because we have a correct picture of the world through the scriptures, through the preaching of the gospel. We have a correct version we have a correct idea of what the world was, and so the guys went out to explore. That's where science came from. Uh, we're going to talk about the biblical the theistic basis for science, which I, prime, I just hinted at, 
the fact that if you have the right if you have the right knowledge about how who created it, what what it's for, etc., uh, you have a theistic basis for science. And I'll show you that that's where science came from. It came from the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Then I'll talk about the history of modern science. Of course, all things must come to an end sometime. You know? So things are really ramping up. 1500, 1600, 1700, things are ramping up. And of course, doesn't, I mean, the, the devil isn't going to sit back. And so then things start coming crashing down. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you get into this naturalistic science where it flip-flops. You go from scientists that believe in God to scientists that say, we won't even talk about God. Don't even mention his name. Right. Well, that, that's ridiculous. But there, you're going to see that. But there is a resurgence of biblical, uh, resurgence of biblical theistic science, and uh, I'm, I guess I'm part of that because I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Okay, so there is a resurgence, and I'm just telling you what's going out there. I'm not, I can't give you all the things that are going on out there, but it's pretty amazing. Okay, say so what are you going to learn tonight? Well, you'll learn how the Bible influenced science, or you're going to learn throughout this. Uh, Science and the Bible, you're going to learn how the Bible influenced science and scientific thought, that modern science was made possible because of biblical worldview, that many of the scientists of today at the beginning of the Reformation, and that the naturalism of today is being vigorously questioned and repudiated, which I just told you that. All right. Here is Jupiter. Psalm 14.1, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven from the children upon the children of man to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. But here's the problem right here. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right. So if you say there is no God, guess what that what guess how God defines you? As a fool. Alright. So sorry, I mean that's just the way it is. Yeah. Amen. I mean, the book is standing, it's sitting there. You can't, you can't uh, move it. You know, the King James Bible is there. You can't move it. That's what it says. It's been saying that for close to 400 years. All right. Testimony from scriptures. Let's see. I've got a Bible. Let's see. All right. I'm just going to look at a few of these just for for time's sake. Okay. Uh, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, Moses says that God is a creator. Uh, God says he's a creator. In Job 38.6-7, Isaiah 40.25-27, David said God is a creator in Psalm 8.3-9, Psalm 14-1. John says that God is a creator in John 1, 1 to 3. Paul says God is a creator in Romans 1, 19 to 22. Colossians 1, 14 to 17. And Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. Peter says, now, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 5 to 12 that God is a creator. And Jesus himself says that he is a creator. He is the creator of money. So the testimony of the scripture said that God is a creator. Let's go to Genesis 1, 1. Genesis 1, 1. We'll just look at a few of these verses, but I wanted to say that just so it got on the on the tape there. And this is just a few of this is just a sample. But all throughout the Bible, nobody questions that God is the creator. Nobody. Nobody. No, no question at all. In fact, in the book of Job, you can go through about three or four chapters where God is talking directly to Job and he says, Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? Where were you? Where were you? How about this? Can you explain this, 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 right? Uh, Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you got a Bible that says different than that, you got the wrong Bible. Okay? Right. If you got something that says heavens, in the beginning God created the heavens and the wrong Bible. That goes from that goes for the New King James Version, the New International Version, New American Standard Bible, uh, New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. So if you have a Bible that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you might as well be reading, on that verse right there, you might as well be reading the Jehovah's Witness Bible, because that's what the Jehovah's Witness Bible says. That's wrong. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's go to Job 38. Let's see what God has to say about this. Job 38. Oh, uh, uh, just by way of 
introduction here. I've got a lot of information on burningbrightministries.com uh, on the web, and then this is also being broadcast on Beetle, on Burning Bright TV. And so find out uh, about the King James Version Bible or Rightly Dividing, you can go on my website and, and the videos are there and uh, also the handouts are, are there so you can uh, download those for free. They're called PDFs. Burningbrightministries.com. Right. Job 38, verses 6 and 7. Um, we'll look at verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, let's start at verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thy me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? So, verse 4. Declare if thou hast understanding. Who laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Verse 5. Verse 6. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Verse 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had worship, uh, issued out of the womb? Verse 9. We say, saying who he's talking about. He's talking about himself. He's talking God's talking about himself. He's saying to Job, where were you when all, I was doing all this? You know, Job is, Job's, just a, you know, Job's a man. And he's arguing with God, and God says, well, where were you when I was doing all this? When I was making all the stars and making all the water and everything? Uh, verse 9, when I made the cloud garment thereof, and the thick darkness a swallowing band for it, and break up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors. So God himself says that he created things. And, the, and you know, you got John, uh, David and John. Let's go to John chapter 1. This is what John thinks of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible. It's affirmed that God is the creator. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word is Jesus Christ. And that's what the book says right there. Just sit. And then you got Paul, Peter, and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Let's... Let's see what Jesus says himself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. No, no apologies whatsoever. That's what he says. I am it, Jesus Christ. The little baby born in the manger that died on the cross for you and I, he is actually the creator as, as well. I am Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He goes this as far this way as that way. Amen. Aren't you glad you're in Christ? Because you know what? Yeah. You go all as far from this way all the way to that. Yeah. You get that? If you're in Christ, you go over this way. This way. I saw a little hesitation like, huh? Yeah. If you're in Christ, you're in this way to that way. Amen. <laughs> I'm watching you guys out there. I'm watching to see what's going on out there. I know you're watching me. Uh, overview of science. Now this is quick. This is going to be quick. But if you get that, it's going to be quick. Science never had a real chance under the pagan ideas of pantheism and polytheism. I'll define that tomorrow. The world had rejected revelation, found the Old Testament was mired in pagan philosophies and superstition. That took us all the way up to 1500 A.D. So almost for, I'm sorry, 5,500 years. Rejected, uh, the world rejected that found that Old Testament was mired in pagan philosophies and superstitions. So that would take you up to the Christ, and then uh, from Christ on, with the advent of Christ and the preaching of the gospel, the world was given another chance. The church joined Rome, and you end up with the thousand years of the Dark Ages. So that's 5,500 years of just total rejection of the Word of God. And so you didn't get very much going on. The Renaissance and Reformation occurred. Science is free from the Roman Catholic dogma. They were stuck in the Aristotle system. They were stuck in uh, paganism from Egypt. They were stuck in all kinds of stuff. They just sucked it all in. And so the world went into a dark ages for a thousand years, from 500 to 1500. But then, hey, Gutenberg invents the printing press. The printing press allows the dissemination of the scriptures and information. That's your first information age. 
You know, that's that's it right there. Church attacked uh, the Reformation and the uh, uh, Reformation and the uh, Renaissance on two fronts: theological and scientific. On the theological front, he could not answer the ref the um, reformers. That's like Martin Luther, William Tyndale, reformers said, "Hey, you guys aren't teaching what's in the Bible." Well, we got the Pope saying this, but the Bible says this. So they couldn't argue from the Bible. So what did they do? They just persecuted people that didn't believe like that. Yeah. You know what? They did the same thing for science that didn't agree with their Aristotle yeah. systems, you know, the way that they thought. And so well, on the science front, it was confronted by the discoveries of Galileo. The Roman Catholic Church used persecution to defend its beliefs. <coughs> they led uh, led to the view that religious was, religion was unscientific, and you see that in textbooks today. They always make religion as a bugaboo. Religion is against science because the church went, went against Galileo. No. It's Bible believers that were going against the Roman Catholic Church. Galileo believed the scriptures. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is, it is. And you're going to see some quotes there. Then you get to Isaac Newton. Now he was a smart guy. He believed in the, in the deity and God, and he believed uh, in, in well, I got some quotes from him later. Isaac Newton's method of discovery had little to do with God, however. He was just interested in the naturalistic approach. The naturalistic critics of the scriptures and Christianity began to rise right around the 1700s. Let's throw God out of the... They attacked the Bible, and then they attacked science. The same the devil started attacking on a two front. Let's get rid of the Bible, and let's get rid of God out of science. That was right in the 1700s. Philosophers doubt the existence of God or his interaction with the world. They came out of France, it came out of Germany. This is a mistake. Darwin publishes his of the species. Okay? In the 1850s. He's a contemporary. Listen, folks, he's a contemporary of Karl Marx and Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort attacked your Bible. Karl Marx attacked the um, church. And Darwin attacked science. They all went down. He had the Scopes Monkey trial in 1925. Bible believing Christians are ridiculed, they're made fun of by science. You know, everything that was almost, I'm trying to say, I want to say everything that the scientists brought forth in the Scope Monkey Monkey trial in 1925 has been debunked, debunked, been debunked by, by even scientists that don't, that believe in Darwinism. 1925. They made us look like fools. You know who the real fools were? They were. Yeah. Efforts begin in earnest to defend the Bible account of the flood. That's when they said, hey, you know, the flood's an explanation for all these strata and where the fossils come and stuff. And then, uh, so that's the start of it in the 1920s, uh, kind of a, a pushback on this uh, scientific thing against the Bible. And then something bad happens to science. Einstein postulates the Big Bang. He discovers that the universe had to have a beginning. And that's important because up to, la up to that time, because of Darwin and everybody, had believed that everything was the same, had been the same forever and ever. It wasn't the same forever and ever. Then they discovered DNA around uh, 1950, and we keep discovering more and more things about DNA. That's also bad for Darwinism. Creation science is founded. Yeah, the fossil record is still com incomplete after 150 years. If you go on the, on the YouTube or web and you start listening to these guys talking about Darwinism, you now hear the, these guys that defend Darwin and say, well, don't look at the fossil record. We don't need the fossil record. Well, Darwin said you need the fossil record. But now they're saying, well, don't talk about the fossil record because the fossil record is incomplete. It doesn't show any, uh, what do you call it, missing links or anything. Many science, now many scientists begin to doubt classical Darwinism. Darwinism said that by natural selection, you're going to get changes in species. Well, the problem is natural selection doesn't create anything. So now that we have uh, mutation, you know, we have DNA, we find about mutations. Okay, mutations. Maybe all of a sudden a fly gets, uh, I mean, a, 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 let's say a, a hedgehog gets wings. You know, boom, like that. It's called neo-Darwinism. It, it talks about mutations coupled with natural selection. Mutations, we'll talk about this later, but mutations can only do one of three things. They can kill the thing, uh, they can make it unusable. I mean, all mutations, most 
most mutations are bad. And the third thing is, uh, what did I say? You can kill the thing. Mutation is bad or it just doesn't affect the thing at all. Okay? Of course, we've got the academia and ACLU continued uh, backing Darwinism. Icons of Evolution is published by Dr. Wells. This is about 10 years ago. He takes 10 of the icons of evolution. Who's ever heard of the, uh, the moth that's on the tree, the black moth that's heard on the tree? Okay. Who's ever heard of the Miller experiment where they, they came up with these mean amino acids in the test tube? Have you ever heard of that? Everybody's been taught that in your high school, okay? Uh, he talks about those 10 icons that Darwinists used to prove evolution. All 10 of those are were either fabricated. Who's ever served that, seen that picture of the embryos, Hackle's embryos? How show evolution through the, the stages. I'll probably have to come up with some pictures of that if you're, you probably forgot. It's been so long because you don't care about this stuff. But all 10 of those that prove, supposedly prove evolution are not true or they've been fabricated or faked. Okay. And then just here of late, within the last 10 years, you've got this thing called intelligent design. It's being part of the scientific debate. In other words, if you have a car engine, which uh, in your car, you go to turn it on, you expect the car to work. I'll have a, a quote from Isaac Adams moment later. You expect that car to work, right? Turn on. Well, why do you expect that engine to work? Well, because it had a designer and it had a maker. All right. Well, that's what they're saying. When you're looking around and looking at all this stuff, and I'll show you some videos later, when you're looking at the things that, that is in nature, it had to have a designer. Had to make it unless you, you're just uh, you're uh, flipped out. <laughs> I, I'm not going to say you know we know who the maker is, but come on, folks. When you see some of this stuff that's in nature, and you you got to think that there is a designer and then there's a maker. Mm -hmm. And that's all intelligent design is doing. It's trying to say, okay, let's get rid of the theological discussion. Let's just talk about looking at this stuff. Is does it have a designer? Or does it have a maker? Only about 14% of the Americans consider Darwinism definitely true. After all these years, only 14% of Americans consider, now this is from a, uh, I saw this a survey from 2006, so it might even be less now. 40% overall say it's true. So that means 60% of the American population still is not convinced on Darwinism. Right. After 150 years. That's a good thing, that's yeah, a good sign. Good because they've been indoctrinated for the last 50 years in school and Darwin is in it. Those uncertain about it went from 7% to 20%. So which way is it going? It's going our way? Yeah. yeah, it's going our way. Here's a picture I got out of, I think, Newsweek or whatever. And of course, the European countries, a lot of folks say it's true. But notice when you get down to the United States, we're the last holdout. No wonder, no wonder the devil hates us and gives us such trouble. Amen? We're the last holdout. I'll show you a little clo closer picture. There you go. There's the United States. 40 percent true. And that number is going to be decreasing, I guarantee you, in the next... Uh, um, Dr. Wells says uh, he's hoping within the next uh, maybe five years, ten years, that Darwinism is going to be thrown in the trash heap of history. Anybody uh, follow Marx? Thinks Marx was a good guy these days? I don't think so. Ask the people in Russia, you know. Maybe there's a few holdouts in academia, but the people had to live through it, they thought it was a mess. Well, Darwinism is a mess. We spent millions and billions of dollars trying to find, you know, missing links and going to planets and all that stuff. It's a mess. It costs us more money than we need to waste our time on. All right, let me show you. Let me show you a machine. This is an electrical machine, and then I'll show you another machine, and we'll take a break. Okay. Now this is a. Um, yeah, this is a. An electric motor is a machine that uses electric energy to produce motion. Electric motors operate a variety of devices, from vacuum cleaners in the home, to windshield wipers in the automobile, to conveyor belts in the factory. All electric motors that produce rotation work in essentially the same way as a direct current series motor, which is commonly used to drive electric railroad cars. Current flows through a wire to a block of graphite called a brush. The brush transmits current to the commutator, which consists of two or more semicircular split rings. The commutator to a large coil of wire called the armature and to the output shaft. Current flows from the commutator through the armature, then back to the commutator. Current then flows through another brush to one or more electromagnets. Are you getting all this? Made up of a wire coil wrapped yeah. around a piece of iron. 
This flow of current through the magnet's coil. I watched this five times this afternoon. I still don't the field quite has get a north pole it. And a south pole. But it works, okay? You know it works. Amen. The current in the armature, one loop of which is shown, interacts with the magnetic field. Well, it's the back there. Producing motion. It works. The direction of this motion depends upon the directions of the field and the current. <laughs> The split ring of the commutator interacts with the brush to keep the armature current flowing in the same direction relative to the field. Thus, the loop and the output shaft continue to rotate in the same direction. All right. You know what? I, I promised you a break. Why don't we take a break? We'll come back at uh, 8 and I'll show you the next video. Now, a, it's apparent that that has a designer and a maker, right? Yeah. And it's, so, it's kind of complicated. We, you cannot explain how, now you think about it, you put electricity through a wire and you get a magnet. Right. You want to explain that to me? Yeah. It's modern science, you want to tell me how that happens? We know it happens, Michael Faraday showed it happen. How do, you, how do you make that work? Why does that work? And then you can go the other way, like in an alternator, you can spin the wire armature around and you can get electricity. You want to explain it to me how that works? Hello? Okay. So if we take this thing, this physical thing that's in the universe, and you know works anywhere you go from here to Alpha Centauri, it works wherever, you know, and we build an electric motor and we think we're somebody, right? Well, wait till you see the next video after the break. All right, let's take a little break.